the reveal trailer for Kane and Lynch 2 Dog Days is one of the hardest fucking things you'll ever see. At a glance, Kane and Lynch 2 can easily come across as a straightforward action game, an excessively gritty and ultra-violent one that exemplifies the worst and most base tendencies of the seventh generation of consoles. Seemingly pointless, brutal violence, a desaturated color scheme, and an inane narrative the works. A quintessential stupid-ass Xbox 360 shoot-'em-up through and through. When Kane and Lynch 2 released in 2010, it was critically panned. Eviscerated. 6.5 out of 10. 6 out of 10. 5 out of 10. 1 out of 10. 8 out of 10. 8.5 out of 10. 9 out- wait, wait, what? <clears throat> Over the decade following its release, Dog Days kind of faded into obscurity, as different titles came into the spotlight to prove to the masses that games were in fact art in a more traditionally digestible manner. But surely a title with as stark a style that evoked reactions as disparate as a 1 out of 10 and 9 out of 10 must hold some artistic merit, right? Spoilers for the rest of the video. Yeah. Fucking right indeed. Today I want to explore Kane and Lynch 2 as genuinely as possible. To put it under a microscope and pick apart what makes it so uniquely effective and ahead of its time as a game that communicated a litany of lasting messages through every part of itself. From its grounded visual stylings, to its stomach-churning cruelty, to its remorseless and hollow characters and narrative. This is a game about violence. I'll fucking kill you! <laughs> More specifically, this is a game that critiques the voyeuristic violence of video games, the kind of mindless violence innate to a large chunk of Xbox 360 and PS3 era games. It plays out like a pitch black parody of linear third person shooters of the time, with its excessively on rails level design, its borderline nonsensical narrative, and of course, its senseless, endless, nauseating violence. Now. If you think I'm bullshitting, or reading too deep into things, let's start by taking a look at the very first shot of Dog Days. The first thing you see when starting a new game. A camera. And judging by the intentional shakiness of the frame, this is a camera recording another camera, recording brutal violence for the enjoyment of others. This means something, at once establishing voyeuristic on-screen violence as the main point of commentary and setting up Dog Day's show-don't-tell mentality by which this commentary will be communicated. The aesthetics of Kane and Lynch 2 are a huge part of what defines it and contributes to its meaning. It's shot like a snuff film, like something you'd find on the fucking dark web, something you should not be seeing. The game is drenched in digital noise. Screens flicker, lights carry out from their source, explosions tear the image apart. There's even a feature where headshots are blurred, which is somehow worse than actually seeing brutal head trauma. Because of the implication. The whole game is made to look like it's being filmed through a dirty handheld camera by some unknown third participant. This grounded texture brings the player into the violence as that unknown third participant. For all intents and purposes, you are the person behind the camera. You are the third person shooting the third person shooter. The game goes as far as to acknowledge the player as a physical presence in the final hour. That's some bold shit right there. Physically manifesting the player as an actual, real live element inside the game serves the purpose that a lot of its features do, which is to create a tangible reality, one that is so bleak and affecting that it hopefully gets you to reflect on the lurid nature of the brutality you're witnessing, and by proxy, the interactive medium's lurid obsession with violence as a whole, particularly during the 2000s and early 2010s. <laughs> The player's bodily presence also plays into the game's abrupt ending, where Kane and Lynch board a plane and effectively escape the story. As they fly away, the cameraman just fucking keels over and dies. Likely shot to death in the criminal context of the game, but figuratively it's more like Io telling you, we've said all we have to say, so it's time to go, and your window into this world unceremoniously slams shut because the game is done talking to you. Cue credits. 
Everything Dog Days wants to discuss climaxes by the end of the batshit bonkers building sequence in the penultimate level, and the final chapter serves as more of a wind down to give the literal story some semblance of closure, at least in my opinion. This is not a traditionally satisfying ending by any means, but it lines up with the game's meta quality. Another integral element through which Dog Days relays its central message is, of course, the gameplay. In line with Naughty Dog's mantra in making The Last of Us Part II, this game is not fun. But unlike The Last of Us Part II, which does in fact have fun, dynamic, and replayable core gameplay, that's why you see countless YouTube channels pulling fucking trick shots on the people you're supposed to feel empathy for as they scream and cry for their dead friends, IO Interactive had the gall to make a game that is actually, quite literally, not fun. <laughs> Which I believe is intentional to a degree. It, it could just be that the game's terrible though. I, uh, uh, I, I do believe that is a factor. <laughs> the third person shooter gameplay, and by extension the violence wrought through it, is grueling and rote. It leaves you begging for anything else from this medium, as a no button on the controller serves any purpose other than murdering or moving towards more murder. It's laser focused game design that communicates its intent and attitude towards repetitive gaming bloodshed purely through your or interaction with it and the feelings that interaction elicits. After an hour or two, Dog Days lulls you into a rhythm with its shooting and killing, turning it routine and predictable, showing that even the most heinous violence can eventually be normalized, as normalized as violence generally is across the industry. It's a little crazy to me that people viewed Dog Days as basically normal at the time of release, just another shooter in 2010, when you literally carved through thousands of people in the three hours it takes to beat the game. The amount of bodies per minute is patently absurd, even for an Xbox 360 shooter. It speaks to just how normalized mindless murder had become by 2010, even when IO took it to the utmost extreme, to the very edge of satire. Critics and players just shrugged it off as run of the mill. Which, in a way, I do understand, because A, the game isn't exactly forthright with its commentary and can easily come across as just another standard shooter on a surface level, and B, realistically executed violence in video games had been around long enough by that point that it had just become something we didn't really even think about, despite it being the main method of interaction and I would say like 75% of all games on shelves, but put in this context where you deliberately do nothing but despicably murder throughout the whole game, you start to think about it a little bit, especially during the ever so brief moments of downtime between massacres. In these moments, you see the bodies left lying on the ground and really absorb the chaos left in your wake. The level design is so confined and claustrophobic that it's impossible not to walk directly over the horrifying results of your actions as you trudge forward, which prompts introspection in the same way Hotline Miami does when you're forced to walk back through the levels you've just punched, shot, and door slammed your way through. Horse mask supremacy, by the way. Another bold element that adds to the carnage is that a good chunk of the corpses you create aren't even those of enemies. The second door you ever kick down in Dog Days leads into the home of a random civilian. Not a gangster, not a faceless gun-toting antagonist, just a normal, innocent man. During my initial run of this moment, I raised my gun. Curious. Civilians are present throughout many of the firefights in Dog Days, and there is no consequence for shooting them. In fact, it's difficult not to shoot them, and when you inevitably do, no one comments on it. Nothing comes of it. The price of human life is negligible in Kane and Lynch 2, as it so often was across the seventh generation of consoles. Alongside the gameplay, Kane and Lynch 2's plot is paper thin. But to me, plot doesn't really matter that much here, more so what the plot's structure communicates. Dog Day's utterly absurd narrative of our two protagonists nearly teleporting from location to location without explanation as violence constantly erupts around them feels like a not so subtle commentary on the lackluster video game stories of that era, especially those of action games. And at the same time, on a literal level, it also manages to be this exceedingly dark and surreal comedy where things just keep getting worse and worse and more and more insane until it just fucking ends. <laughs> There's a lot of meat to pick apart within the game in terms of the various things it's commenting on through its structure, like game linearity. Which way? Hell, I don't know. 
The hyper-focus products of the time had on contrived brutality and action over any sort of meaningful plot, and the absurdity and stupidity of a lot of those Xbox 360 era plots. So yeah, the literal narrative is thin, but it's not like the game isn't doing anything at all with its narrative. It's just all done in the background, ruminating on a variety of concepts wordlessly with feelings articulated through the experience. For example, let's just go over three things Dog Day's story structure considers, which is the shit I mentioned like 10 seconds ago in that last run-on sentence. Topic number one, game linearity. Three years before Dog Days, Bioshock became the primary example of a linear game using its format to do meta-commentary on the idea of game linearity, with its ultra-famous Would You Kindly twist. Kane and Lynch 2 is doing something similar, but it never goes as far as to show its hand with a plot point that outright states, you've been being controlled this whole time and the linear nature of the game was a subversive way to reinforce that, or some shit like that. What Dog Days does is just stick you in the most linear possible nightmare scenario ever. You enter a room, kill everybody inside it, and you do this what feels like 10,000 more times over the course of multiple exhausting hours. Half the time, the characters don't even know where they're going. They're just stuck on a linear video game track that's always pushing forward through more and more bodies. And by the divine hand of video game logic, they always end up where they ought to be. You sure you know where we are? Yeah, 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 just keep going. It starts to drive you insane. And eventually, it starts driving the characters insane. Ah, this is fucking stupid! Holy shit! Ah, fuck! This never ends! I'm tired of this shit! <laughs> They're screaming for this unrelenting absurdity to end. But that can't happen, Lynch. I'm sorry, you're stuck in a 2010 third person shooter. Look at us. We screwed it all up. Why do people always die around us? Because you're stuck in a 2010 third person shooter! Now these lines may just be the writers lampshading the linearity of the title with dialogue that comments on it, but I choose a more charitable reading, in that I think the whole structure of Dog Days is almost a parody of linear third person shooters, the primary action format of the time. It's so excessively linear for so long with such limiting mechanics that through its sheer overwhelming railroading and unbroken focus on graphic murder, it effectively lambasts the entire genre of 7th gen cover shooters and the concept of linearity in games as a whole. Topic number two. The hyper-focused products of the time had on violence and action over any kind of meaningful plot. All right, so there's very nearly no cutscene in Dog Days that doesn't include or end in violence. One of my favorite scenes that I think is legitimately hilarious involves Kane and Lynch awkwardly eating ramen after killing hundreds of people, and then everything just explodes in gunfire around them. This constant mayhem that comes out of virtually nowhere, with mere seconds of setup or rationalization, feels like an intentionally blown up take on action games of this era, where the only real gameplay was action, so you gotta make the action happen, no matter how little sense it may make in any given context. There's always more goons, there's always a reason to fight really makes you appreciate how far the medium storytelling has come in the 13 years since Dog Days. Not to say we didn't have any great stories before Dog Days, of course not. It's more just a rising tides lift all boats sort of thing, where the base standard for storytelling across the industry is now simply higher than it was during the seventh generation. Topic number three, the absurdity and stupidity of a lot of Xbox 360 era stories. I ain't your bro, bro. Let's look at what happens in Caden Lynch 2. Not figuratively or allegorically, but factually. In the back half of this game, two men who've just endured a night of agonizing torture blast their way through hundreds of armed to the teeth military units while bleeding to death in stolen hoodies and loafers. It's completely a fucking ludicrous, knowingly ludicrous to my eyes. It feels like it's written by someone who really grasps the absurdity behind so many of the one-man army Xbox 360 stories and is using that grasp to choke those stories to death creating a warped version of them that is so over the top and non-stop that, again, it makes you reflect on the entire industry's output up until 2010. It just makes me reconsider how brainless and bare bones Army of Two and Gears of War 1 and even the first Kane and Lynch game really are and how we as players deserve, like, more than that from our art.
Dog Day's story is holding up a mirror to the entire style of video game script writing of that era, showing how frivolous it could be with the most preposterous possible iteration of that style that can never be topped as a way of telling the industry that it's time to grow up and out of the adolescent, grimdark, gray and brown desaturated phase that it was stuck in for so long. Let's go. Nowadays, I believe we are getting that aforementioned more that we deserve in further evolved and more artfully considered pieces of interactivity, like, for instance, Outer Wilds, or Disco Elysium, or Edith Finch, or The Last of Us Part II that are built upon the foundations of some of the more experimental and subversive products of the 2000s and 2010s. Products including Kane and Lynch 2 Dog Days. The reveal trailer for Kane and Lynch 2 is surprisingly sensitive. Half of it is Kane fighting for his life, yes, surrounded by indeterminate chaos, fleeing from vague forces. Video games of the time. But the other half is Lynch, and he can't sleep. He caresses the woman he loves. He takes a piss, and he searches his cabinets for his medicine. This sensitivity is what Dog Days posits video games are lacking. They don't have to be all violence. That era is ending, and this is what we're headed towards. A new world of more mature and empathetic interactive art. Kane is fleeing from an encroaching storm, a flood of new ideas. He's alone. Fuck. The only thing left to talk about is, like, anything good? And by that I mean anything optimistic or positive. You know, anything that isn't deliberately disturbing for the purpose of aggressively making a point. Is this a purely pessimistic piece? Pessimistic about humanity? Pessimistic about the quality of games of the time? Or is there any semblance of hope buried in here? Before I played Kane and Lynch 2 again recently, I read Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian for the first time. It's actually what prompted this video to begin with, because I was surprised by the similarities I was seeing between Blood Meridian and Dog Days. They're both stories about Americans venturing through a foreign land and causing chaos with little regard for the local populace. They both use untranslated foreign language to discombobulate the reader or player and add to their deliberately disorienting and surreal vibes. Their cast of characters aren't meant to be traditionally developed or cared about, but more so exist as devices to serve the overall message of the story, and so on and so on. I won't go too deep into the book, but the most important similarity in relation to our discussion is that, like Kane and Lynch 2, Blood Meridian is a story centered around violence both thematically and literally. Amidst all the wanton bloodshed and vividly described heat and disease and grime found in this novel, McCarthy finds beauty in nature. The redeeming qualities of life on this earth sing from the trees, grow underfoot. This made me wonder if and where Dog Days finds beauty. Perhaps nature is a factor here in its absence, as the environment the game takes place in is one antithetical to nature, nothing but concrete and sheet metal and iron gates and unnatural light to match the cold inhumanity of the whole affair, but no, I believe Kane and Lynch 2 finds beauty in music. As has clearly been shown by now, this is a frightening and off-putting game, and as you might expect, the majority of its soundtrack lines up with that. The OST is mostly made up of noise, of clanging metal, and droning nightmarish ambiance, and awful distant scary sounds without definition. It might then surprise you to see that this is the main menu screen. There's a couple more variants, this being another. The serene music in the background, composed specifically for the game, tells me that there is something beautiful out there, even if we're not privy to it. This music weaves in and out of earshot throughout the three-hour journey, popping up occasionally through muted speakers or garbled television sets. It's there. It exists. But it can't reach Kanan Lynch. They can't hear the music. But even if they're nearly deaf to it, 
somewhere there is a woman singing peacefully. There's a rhythm to be found, other than that of pounding gunfire. And who knows, when Kane and Lynch board that plane in the closing seconds of Dog Days, maybe they're headed towards it. Maybe they'll find peace. Maybe they'll destroy it. But in all honesty, it doesn't matter where they go. It matters where we go, where we went. Did we follow them? Or did we let them disappear into the night? All you have to do is look around at the sensitive storytelling, at the emotionally and mechanically complex masterworks we've received since then, at the evolution of the medium, and at the utter lack of boring ass, gritty ass cover shooters to see what we chose. And we chose fucking right, thanks in no small part to Kane and Lynch. I just want to protect you.